Okay, so uh, today is about the uh, notion of anomie, um, and anomie seems to be a very simple notion. Uh, um, anomie means the state of normlessness, and therefore it's very easy uh, to interpret. It looks like it is very easy to interpret uh, anomie. Uh, I will show that's far from the case. Uh, uh, in fact, Durkheim has a pretty complex notion about um, uh, abnormalities uh, um, uh, in the transition to uh, a market economy, uh, in the transition to modernity. But before I do so, let me come back to the issue of the division of labor uh, in, uh, in Durkheim. Uh, 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 though, um, you know, he stages the book uh, with the idea of collective conscience um, and uh, goes a long length explaining why he's using uh, law as an indicator of collective conscience, and we discussed that at great length. Uh, when it comes describing the, different, the crucial differences between mechanical and organic solidarity, he doesn't make much out of it, really. Uh, what drives the analysis of the, this, this distinction, right? Pre-modern and modern societies, uh, to put in other words. The crucial criteria is actually the division of labor. What drives the story is the division of labor. Uh, so in this sense, in fact, uh, I think Durkheim can be understood as being greatly inspired by Adam Smith, right? Who also saw evolution of human societies, as you recall, as a gradual evolution of the division of labor. Uh, Durkheim just does not offer such a complex or sophisticated periodicization of societies, like right? hunting, gathering, and animal husbandry and agricultural and commercial. It just makes this bipolar distinction between mechanical and organic. But if you ask, well, yes, there is a difference in the legal system, but what is fundamentally different is the division of labor. Right? Mechanical solidarity has little division of labor based on similarity of the actors in the society. Uh, organic solidarity has a great deal of division of labor um, and uh, 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 a great deal of the simila similarity of the action. And this is puzzling because the question is if it is such a high level of division of labor and such a, a great diversity, where on earth solidarity will come from, how we hang together. So that's, I think, uh, we, we should appreciate how important the division of labor for Smith uh, from Durkheim was. Uh, by the way, in some ways, uh, even uh, the early uh, Marx uh, um, in uh, uh, the, Ger the German ideology also tried his periodicization of society with the division of labor. So I think this is also the influence of Adam Smith. So I think there is a clear Adam Smith impact uh, uh, on, on, on the work of Durkheim uh, on, uh, on, on the types of uh, uh, solidarity. There is also another issue I would like to uh, uh, mention. Um, uh, uh, I pointed out that how important right, Montesquieu uh, was for Durkheim, and uh, um, it's, it's obvious. Uh, he acknowledges his debt to Montesquieu, uh, start uh, the book uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, 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 collective conscience and the notion uh, of uh, um, in, uh, and, and law as the best empirically uh, observable indicator of this collective conscience comes, of course, directly to Montesquieu. But there is another uh, less uh, frequently noticed uh, impact of Montesquieu uh, on Durkheim, and that makes actually Durkheim a very interesting author for us today. Uh, as I mentioned, he primarily has an impact today with his later work as the cultural analyst. But in his early work, he uh, responded to an other uh, 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 
stimulating idea of Montesquieu, and that is the uh, uh, interaction between social system and, and the environment and the ecological system. Uh, I mean, I, I went at some length in the lecture on Montesquieu uh, to show how important it was and how unique Montesquieu's contribution was and how important it is for us today, though he made it in a very naive way. Durkheim actually has a much more sophisticated and complex understanding uh, of the relationship between environment uh, and, and uh, uh, society uh, 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 and the type of so solidarity and the division of labor uh, in society. Uh, unfortunately, this is a sort of a neglected element in Durkheim. Too bad because, uh, in fact, uh, you know, the problem of environment and studying environment should be a central issue uh, in economics, political science, sociology, and anthropology. And it is not quite as central as it should be, uh, especially, I think, in political science and uh, sociology and anthropology. The study of environment is too narrowly focused on environmental social movements. Well, Durkheim has a different interesting take, uh, which I think uh, should inspire uh, social researchers, be, be they economists, political scientists, sociologists, or anthropologists. What is it? Durkheim, in the division of labor, has a core of an idea what one can call the ecosystem, right? Uh, he sees an interrelationship between the physical environment, the size of population which lives in this physical environment, the technology which is used uh, uh, in this environment and the division of labor, and the type of social organization what we have, what kind of social solidarity you have. Let me just put this on the blackboard. Uh, I think this is uh, rarely noticed. You will rarely hear in um, Durkheim's <coughs> lectures or rarely read about this when you read uh, uh, about Durkheim. Uh, so the idea is that you have uh, uh, the environment, you have the population, you have technology, and you have social organization. And this constitute a system, right? which interacts with each other. And what ought to be studied is really this whole system. And, you know, of course, technology uh, has a lot to do with division of labor. Right? Uh, and that's what can be called the ecosystem. Uh, he doesn't call it this way. But environmental researchers would call it today as the ecosystem. Uh, and I think this is an extremely productive way uh, for social scientists to think about the problems of environment, right? Uh, and let me give you an example. Uh, uh, why don't you think about Southern California, right? Southern California, uh, before uh, the Europeans appeared on the scene, right, uh, was a very uh, uh, dry climate, suffered from the lack of water resources. Uh, so the Los Angeles Basin probably could accommodate a livelihood for something like 20,000 people, right? These 20,000 people, right, lived in this uh, very arid uh, environment, lose, uh, used very elementary technologies, and very, had a very limited division of labor, uh, so the population size was greatly affected with the technology and the environment, and they had mechanical solidarity, right? Uh, that was the way how society was organized. Now, today, uh, we figured out how to solve the, uh, the uh, hydraulic problems for the Los Angeles Basin for the time being. Uh, don't hold your breath because in no time we may have a major crisis. So in the same basin where 20,000 people lived, now 20 million people live. Uh, 
but they live at a very uh, high level of technology. Uh, we successfully pollute the air, which is uh, uh, right uh, uh, hard, hard to breathe in downtown Los Angeles during a hot summer day. Right? Um, uh, and we have, of course, uh, uh, organic solidarity operating, right, large. So, uh, and we, you know, manage to screw the environment, thank you, quite nicely, you know, and we keep doing it. In no time, the LA basin will be uninhabitable, right? That's why I think it is interesting to think about uh, uh, this Durkheimian idea of ecosystem, how it interacts. As I said, it would offer you a very rigorous, right, scientific frame framework. Uh, to study the interaction, right, between social organization, the demographic pro problem, the technological issues, right, and, and, uh, um, uh, and its uh, relationship, how we can live if we can peacefully with the environment. Anyway, it's just a backdrop because uh, 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 to show again the centrality of the division of labor uh, for Durkheim. Now, uh, today I will talk about uh, um, anomie, um, and anomie is uh, one of the abnormal uh, consequences of uh, uh, the division of uh, uh, labor. Uh, and uh, well, this is uh, one of the troubling aspects uh, of Durkheim's work. Uh, the whole idea of abnormality or social pathologies. And he has been criticized about this a great deal. Um, how do we know uh, what is abnormal and how, 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 how on earth can we tell what is the normal state of society? Pathology does assume, right, that social researchers have some way how to judge what is the healthy condition for society. And this comes from uh, Durkheim's uh, early functionalism, as I said, right? He was greatly influenced by biology. He was not a biologist by any means. But as I pointed out, the whole metaphor of organic solidarity uses the human body, right, um, as the example, right? Uh, how in the human body, diverse organs depend on each other to reproduce each other. And therefore, the word pathology is also borrowed from medical sciences. Society will have pathological features as well. And there are abnormalities in society, and somehow believes uh, that social researchers will be able to establish what abnormality is and what patholo pathologies are. This is, I think, um, troubling for most social scientists, right? Because we uh, seem to have some commitment to at least value neutral type of analysis, right, with, in which we do not label necessarily phenomena out, right? We know labeling theory, you may have heard about it. Uh, you label something as criminal or abnormal uh, simply because it's probably unusual in society. Um, but what, what was abnormal uh, in one society? may become absolutely normal in another society. So you have to be extremely careful, right, with the notion of normal and abnormal. Uh, let's say uh, being gay until fairly recently uh, was seen, I mean, except uh, antiquity. But for most human uh, societies and most uh, cultures, being gay is seen as a kind of abnormal behavior. Today, very few people will think about this, at least in a country like the United States, that somebody gay is in abnormal, right? Uh, uh, so what sexual behavior is normal or abnormal depends uh, uh, on the times, right? It's really not the job of the social scientist to be able to decide, you know, what kind of sexual behavior should be called normal or abnormal. The best we can do, why on earth some people call some sexual practices abnormal and others normal? Why is there differences in a society accepting some kind of sexual behaviors and not others, right? That is a question what social scientists 
could study. Anyway, this is, uh, I think, clearly um, um, a problem uh, in, in, uh, 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 for contemporary social scientists uh, with uh, uh, Durkheim's work. But anyway, he did believe that he is capable to show uh, that some abnormal development do take place. He was especially, as I pointed already in last lecture out, on the transition from uh, um, a mechanical to organic solidarity. And the, when that happened, then uh, pat pathologies uh, uh, could emerge. And again, put it into the social context. Durkheim is writing in the uh, 1890s and early 1900s. He's uh, in Bordeaux, and then he's moving to Paris, the city of the sin, right? And he sees uh, all the signs of social pathologies, right? Uh, alcoholism and homelessness and prostitution and theft and crime, uh, which was inexistent or much later in rural France uh, uh, just a couple of decades ago. So he's confronted, right, with massive phenomena which is being seen as abnormal or pathological, and he identifies them uh, as the results of the transition from mechanical to organic solidarity. Well, a pathologist can have two different roots. Um, and uh, what we normally understand from uh, Durkheim, that he identifies pathologies from the absence of rules. That's what the term anomy refers to. But interestingly enough, I have the citations for you, and if you have read the text carefully, you found the citations as well. He actually also does consider that pathologies can also result from the overregulation, right, of too forced division of labor. I think it's very intriguing uh, to see this because we normally counterpose Marx's theory of alienation and Durkheim's theory of anomie. As Durkheim is complaining there is not enough regulation in society, why Marx is arguing there is too much regulation in society. And I will give you a number of citations now uh, uh, from uh, uh, Durkheim, which actually will show that the difference between Marx and Weber is not such gigantic as we initially might have thought or generally uh, would assume. There are, uh, uh, Durkheim is quite sensitive to some of the Marxian analysis, even to the Marxian notion of alienation. He doesn't use the term, but gets very close to it. So let me just move on further and um, uh, talk about pathologies, pathologies which are coming from the absence of, of rules. Well, uh, and I will briefly say, uh, uh, this interesting uh, uh, idea that, in fact, division of labor can be the source of solidarity. As I said, this is counterintuitive. Uh, we did believe that solid solidarity comes from relatively small size communities where people are relatively similar, share the same values and the same system, same norms, uh, and then they will have uh, solidaristic feelings towards each other. When people are, are very different, they are competing on the marketplace, they are, they, uh, you know, are strangers in the uh, cities, they don't know, know each other, uh, uh, they, uh, they sub subscribe to different values, uh, or they even don't know what values they should obey because they are confused. They just left the village and ended up in the big and sinful city, and they don't really quite know, can I do here anything? Is there any control over me or none? You know, it's all up to me what to do. Even stealing is all right. Selling my body is all right. Uh, I see other people who do that. Why don't I do it? They are not being caught. I probably will not be caught either. So that is a kind of, right, under these circumstances when there are no uh, 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 you know, similarities, why on earth? Uh, 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 will be solidaristic. We don't know um, other people. And, and we have these stereotypes that, you know, in urban industrial society, we are not solidaristic, right? Uh, 
uh, this is the, you know, the usual stereotype. You say, you go to New York City, right, and there is somebody who is dying on the streets, and other people are just stepping over that person, right? Who cares? You can die on the street, and there will be hundreds of passengers going by and let you die. It's actually not true, right? Um, if you ever have seen anybody, uh, you know, feel, feeling ill uh, uh, in Times Square, I mean, there are usually a lot of people who rush to it and say, are you all right, or that kind of stuff. Um, but anyway, uh, but you know the stereotype, right? Uh, uh, so usual stereotype uh, about the cities. Anyway, so it's puzzling why uh, a society which is so different, anonymous, and such a high division of labor can be solidaristic. Then he defines various pathologies. And interesting, the pathology, one, sounds very similar, very close to Marx. Well, there is crisis uh, um, in the system, and there is increasing class conflict, and this class conflict is pathological. Um, and the second one, uh, well, and it, again, something which is not all that different from what Karl Marx. Uh, division of labor can be too excessive, and too much division of labor uh, can lead to pathological consequences. And finally, uh, his unique contribution that pathology can come from the lack of regulation, and that's what he calls anomie. Now let me uh, 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 work on this and also the concept of um, anomie a little more. So here it is, uh, the division of labor as a source uh, of solidarity, right? He said, well, normally the division of labor produces social solidarity. Uh, well, but uh, it can happen uh, that there are the opposite results, right? So therefore, he said, when we know when division of labor creates social so so solidarity, then we will be better equipped to figure out when actually social solidarity has pathological consequences. And as you can see from the citation, he directly cites uh, the medical um, uh, uh, metaphor, right? Here, as elsewhere, pathology is a precious ancillary to physiology. So you start with physiology of society, uh, you identify when it works normally, and then you will be able to show when it is pathological, right? That's the fundamental idea. And this is in a way how he tries to get off the hook of the problem that he actually capable to tell what is pathological. All right, uh, now the first patholo pathology uh, is actually about class conflict. He said, well, uh, and I think Marx would, have, would not have been particularly unhappy with this citation, right? As labor becomes increasingly divided, there are commercial crises, there are bankruptcies, there is hostility between labor and capital, and then it, you know, all these conflicts become more frequent, right? Well, uh, in traditional societies, in mechanical solidarities, well, these class conflicts were rare and unusual. Well, uh, today, uh, they are not all that unusual. And he uses the term working class, right? He said, uh, part of the working class do not really desire the status assigned to them, right? Well, not quite a theory of exploitation, but certainly uh, an expression that too high level of division of labor in absence of other uh, can create in class conflict, which is a pathological consequence of high division of labor. Then he goes on and he writes about um, excessive division of labor. Uh, well, <laughs> he has not read the Paris manuscripts, which was not published, of course, um, for uh, 14 more years after he died. But, yeah, you have read the Paris Manuscripts, and you can see these interesting parallels. The individual will isolate himself in his own activity, 
he will no longer be aware of the collaborator who work at his side on the same task. He has even not longer any idea at all what the common task consists. <laughs> Is not that miraculous? He could not have the faintest idea that a work called the Paris Manuscripts exists, right? And here, what is being described is getting very, very close to the idea of alienation, right? And in fact, comes very close to the Marxian notion of alienation, not the Hegelian one. The Marxian notion, because he roots it into excessive division of labor. Too much market, right? Uh, too much competition uh, creates this situation. So I think this is miraculous, and very often, you know, this uh, sentences are kind of skipped over as a kind of throwaway line uh, by uh, Durkheim. It isn't. It is very important to identify what his unique contribution is. And this is indeed the emphasis uh, that a pathology can occur out of the lack of regulation. And lack of regulation means anomie. Well, uh, he said, well, it is not necessary for social life to be without struggle. Struggle in itself is not that bad at all. The role of organic solidarity is not to abolish uh, competition, but to moderate it, right? Well, I just want to remind you, um, this in a way uh, reminds us to Adam Smith, right? his sympathetic theory of human nature, right? Uh, well, uh, unlimited competition is not right, right? Unlimited egoistic behavior is not right. We have to be sympathetic to the other person, right? We are struggling for recognition by others, right? That is the idea where there is a similarity in Durkheim's and Adam Smith's analysis but but then he but he then he continues but in some cases and this is crucial the regulatory process which moderates competition either does not exist at all or not related to the degree of development of the division of labor it is insufficient they, there are either no regulations or not enough regulations if then Division of labor does not produce solidarity. Um, it is because the relationship between organs are not regulated, and this is what I call anomie, right? And uh, again, you see the social context. Uh, this is exactly coming from uh, the empirical reference point. Rural young people get on the train and that uh, get off the train in Gare uh, Lazare, Saint Lazare, and then they walk into the street in wild Paris, the sinful city of Paris, and they are lost. Suddenly, their value system, what they were told back home in the village, collapses. Right? Back in the village, they knew exactly what they are supposed to do. Everybody knew them, and they also knew if they are breaking the laws right, of the community, they will be immediately punished because there will be gossip spreading around and get back to home and mom and dad will exactly hear what you have done on the street, what you were not supposed to do. Now you are in Paris. Nobody has the faintest idea who, who, who you are. And even you don't know what other people expect from you, right? It looks like this is the realm of freedom. You can do anything, right? Well, back home in the village, uh, if you were engaged, you better do not hold hands with another partner on the street, right? Because then the gossip will back to your fiancé and to her parents or his parents and your parents immediately. And there will be a scandal. Well, um, if you are walking on bullmish, uh, you can do anything. You can hold the hand of anybody. You can kiss anybody, right? 
nobody knows who you are, right? So that's it, you know, that is the problem, right, of anomie, that people enter in a society in which they are lost. Um, uh, well, uh, let me just labor a little longer on the idea. And, and here again see that even the notion of anomie, uh, I mean, it's probably, I, I don't know whether how much it is uh, making, he's making his argument too complex, or Marx's idea of uh, 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 alienation was too complex. But you, you can see here again some similarities even between anomie and the Marxian notion of alienation. He said the division of labor may re reduce the worker to the role of a machine. He's not aware of where the operation required of him are leading, and he does not link them to any aim. Ooh. Every day he repeats the same movements with monotonous regularity, but without having any understanding, interest in understanding of them. Huh? How interesting, right? Uh, that's where uh, in uh, uh, Durkheim's way, uh, uh, thinking, the lack of norms or values, the collapse of the value system leading to. Uh, and for him, of course, that's a big difference. The solution is to fix the system of values, right? To fix the system of norms and then you solve the problem of alienation. But he also said that, look, anomie uh, is not an inevitable consequence of the division of labor, right? And, uh, well, he has a conception that, you know, lab division of labor can be forced and can be excessive, right? There must be in elements in the collective conscience which moderate, right? the competitive elements uh, of the division of labor. But if those institutions, you know, cultural, legal, moral, ethical institutions are in place, then in fact um, uh, the division of labor will not produce anomie. It only will produce such if uh, there is uh, uh, no such um, uh, systems. But then he said, don't, do not read me as a romantic. I don't want to idealize the village community where these boys and girls and Gar Lazar are coming out of the train, right? I don't want to send them back to the rural village. I'm not advocating a return from organic solidarity to mechanical solidarity. All that I'm showing under what circumstances there are pathological consequences, right? Uh, in organic solidarity, and therefore we have to find the proper medication, the proper, proper cocktail of drugs by which we can cure uh, these disease, right? That is the key idea. Well, and now another very interesting uh, argument, uh, which is usually neglected in um, reading uh, Durkheim. He said, look, there are pathologies in society which are coming from over-regulation and forced division of labor. Uh, well, this is uh, already in uh, the uh, uh, division of labor, but a crucial text is, in fact, uh, the so-called second introduction into the division of labor. Uh, Durkheim received a lot of criticism um, of the first edition of the Division of Labor, was criticized of being uh, uh, too uh, conservative politically, and that's when he wrote uh, um, the second uh, um, introduction to the Division of Labor. And if you are interested at all in Durkheim, you have to read the second introduction um, uh, the introduction to the second edition of the Division of Labor. Because here he tries to offer uh, some quote-unquote progressive solution uh, to the problems uh, of uh, 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 
anomi um, and the nature of uh, solidarity in organic uh, societies. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, how to overcome the problem of class conflicts uh, uh, in modern society. And there his idea is that really these solidarities, this is the idea he develops in the uh, 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 introduction to the second edition, that we are becoming uh, uh, solidaristic uh, uh, within our professions. These are the professional organizations in which we will find our identities and solidarities. So he actually sees the good society as evolving into multiplicity of professional organizations in which people fit into this professional environment and do have a strong professional identity and solidaristic attitudes towards the profession. Uh, uh, this is right a radically different idea, right? From the it's not dealing with uh, markets, uh, not messing up with the markets, or not not messing up too much with the markets. To put it this way, right? Uh, uh, you know, professional organizations, if they are effective, they do mess up with the markets, right? American Medical Association does mess up because it's a kind of trade union, right? Which um, uh, make sure that uh, 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 the doctor's interests are being uh, particularly represented. Um, anyway, uh, this is uh, uh, the second introduction. But what is interesting in, in, in this citation is that he said, well, uh, pathology can emerge actually from excessive level of, uh, of uh, uh, regulation or forced division of, of, of labor. And uh, he introduces an, another notion here, and this is fatalism. So there are these two different pathologies uh, uh, of uh, 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 modern societies. Uh, uh, one is emerging uh, in the transition from mechanical to organic solidarity, given the absence um, of uh, commonly shared values, uh, and that's anomie. And there is another possible, um, on, on the other end of the scale, you have too excessive regulation, and then people become fatalistic, because they, then they think there is nothing what they can do, right? Anomie is when you can see anything goes, you know, I can get away with anything, right? Or you are desperate, you know, uh, because you don't know uh, what on earth uh, 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 you uh, uh, want to do with yourself. Uh, fatalism is uh, when you think, well, uh, I have no control over my life. I am overregulated, right? And then you become fatalistic. It doesn't matter. Uh, nothing matters because uh, 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 it's overregulated. Okay. Uh, now let me just very briefly uh, compare uh, uh, these uh, 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 three ideas uh, of uh, 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 Marx, uh, uh, Weber, and Durkheim. Uh, well, I hope I did not confuse you too much uh, with some of the citations, which are quite counterintuitive, but it's important to see the sophistication of the analysis. Uh, the bottom line of the role is, he said, look, my unique contribution to the study of pathologies of modern society is the theory of anomy, uh, which says that temporarily in this transition uh, we have uh, a problem of absence of rules. This will be overcome because there is no reason why a properly moderated competition and division of labor could not create actually very high levels of solidarity. And the mechanism he suggests in the second introduction is, you know, creation of a professional organization and slotting people into professional communities as such. They are not going back to the villages, but they will be sort of belonging to professional communities and having solidaristic ideas and um, identities there. 
So this is the kind of a bottom line. He is sensitive to the problems uh, uh, what Marx is talking about. He understands that, yes, modern society does create class conflicts, and this is a problem because the working class very often feels ill-treated, uh, doesn't use the term exploited, but, you know, it's um, uh, unhappy with the position assigned to it. So he sees this is a problem. He also sees the problem uh, that excessive uh, 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 division of labor may create a sense of, it doesn't use the term, but really what he means, alienation, right? Um, and he also is quite aware that too much regulation also can create a pathological state of mind, fatalism. Uh, so, uh, but the major contribution is, as I've said, anomy is uh, um, insufficient regulation in society. This is his unique contribution. Well, um, alienation, as we have seen, um, is more like fatalism, right, in Durkheim. It comes uh, from uh, too much regulation. And then we have a Weber's notion of disenchantment, right? The loss of the enchanted God. And this is all, all coming, you know, the kind of mood or feel, uh, the human condition under modernity, right? These are three different takes. For Weber, it is the loss of magic, right? Um, and uh, the, in a way, the conversion of the dense and all-sided, you know, human relationships into instrumental relationships. Um, I think I briefly mentioned uh, in uh, the lecture on uh, alienation, or and probably also uh, you know, lecture on uh, 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 Weber, uh, Weber um, uh, that this is actually very similar to the ideas of uh, George Lukács, who was a Marxist philosopher and who developed the theory of reification. Uh, Weber is developing the theory of disenchantment. What is the problem of modernity? That we lost the enchanted garden, that we are too rationalistic, too cold, too instrumental. Uh, at a time when Lukács uh, is shifting from Hegel to Marx and invents the idea of reification. And they happen to both live at that time uh, in Heidelberg and uh, George Lukács, who was a young man at that time in his 20s, was a frequent guest uh, in, the in the Weber house, in the saloon run by Mariana Weber. So there is clearly a mutual um, uh, influence on Lukács' unique interpretation of Marx's theory of alienation, uh, that human relationships are becoming reified, and uh, uh, Weber's notion of uh, uh, you know, instrumentalization of life, which is, uh, uh, I think, distinctly different both from the theory of anomie um, and alienation. Okay, uh, um, uh, a final note on uh, Durkheim's theory uh, of human nature. What was his theory of human nature? And here, um, uh, uh, we uh, can see uh, a sharp distinction between uh, Marx and, and Weber. Uh, Marx, mainly following uh, Rousseau's line, basically believed that he did not have the notion of a uh, state of nature any longer. Uh, by the mid-19th century, people got tired and get rid of it. Um, uh, but uh, uh, he used the term uh, species being, uh, what is the essence, human essence. Uh, uh, well, he said, uh, the essentially humans are fine. Uh, 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 it is the society which is the problem, not the individual. Um, it, uh, so this is exactly, you know, the Rousseauian uh, uh, inspiration in Marx. Society corrupts. 
in the state of nature we were good. And Marx even adds, I think I already made this point, but let me underline one more time. He goes beyond um, uh, Rousseau because Rousseau saw the um, uh, noble savage as a savage, as, as, a, as an individual who has to be brought into society. At that point, Marx disagrees with Rousseau. He sees we were born in society, we are social by nature, right? So our, we are not only good, but we are also social. And it is society which corrupts us, which creates us egoistic individuals who will compete with each other and will kill each other, right? This is exactly the opposite, right, of Hobbes and a, a big step beyond Rousseau's theory of human nature. Now, Durkheim is actually much closer to Hobbes in his notion of uh, 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 human nature uh, because he believes, right, that social pathologies emerge uh, when there is a vacuum of control over people. Uh, that's when you have crime and suicide and prostitution and whatever. Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, he had a skeptical view of human nature. Unless we are controlled, then we can be evil, right? That is the fundamental issue, right? What you have to fix uh, uh, is uh, uh, making sure uh, uh, that individuals uh, um, develop the proper value system. Thank you very much and have a wonderful Thanksgiving break. Yeah, see you the last week of the semester.